maybe we'll just start off with a little bit of bio first. I, so how did you end up as a philosopher? What got you into philosophy in the first place? You asked me to provide a narrative. I don't believe right. in narratives. Um, but I can say something, of course. Um, well, let me think. Um, well, uh, it was semi-accidental. I mean, I left school at 16. And when I went to university, all I really wanted to do was grow my hair and achieve enlightenment. Um, I, thought I, I thought I was already done with drugs by then, but I realized I had a bit more work to do <laughs> on that front. Um, so I, for the first two years, I read or, Oriental studies, in particular, Arabic and uh, Persian. Um, uh, but I suppose you could say I had some sort of predisposition. Um, but I never talked about it at home with my dad, so there's no, 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 no influence that I'm aware of from my father. And Gielan's, um, Gielan's father was P. F. Strassen. He was one of the one of the great philosophers of the of the latter half of the twentieth century. So, but but you didn't, yeah, you didn't I mean, get the philosophy from him, apparently. No, I don't think so. And I mean, as as far as mental styles are inherited, I'd say I got all mine from my mother. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, here's a story. What happened? So I did two years of Oriental studies. Then I thought it was uninterestingly taught. So I was at Cambridge in England. So I took up social and political sciences. Uh, and after a year of that, I thought, well, here's my narrative. That it seemed like a building that started on the fourth floor. And I wanted to know where the basement was and the initial floors uh, or stories or whatever you call them. And I thought that must be in philosophy. So I decided in my final fourth year at Cambridge, I switched to philosophy. But I'd caught hepatitis in Syria that summer. And I only got back to university at the end of October. So my whole undergraduate career in philosophy was only six months. But anyway, the plan was to do that for a year and then go back to social political science, but I got hooked. <clears throat> so that's it. That's All right, the story. well, the, the world of philosophy is lucky that you got hooked. <laughs> um, okay, so what do, you, what do you take philosophy to be? What is philosophy? Oh, well, I mean, as you, as you know, having listened to me a great deal, in the past is that I tend to be just produce quotations now because if anything I can think of to say someone's usually said it better so I've got my little file here and I'm going to read it you will be familiar with these quotations I don't think I can do better than Wilfred Sellers to start with who said and I quote the aim of philosophy is to understand how things in the broadest possible sense of the term hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term that was in 1963. Uh, I would add um, actually something that Schopenhauer said, because I've actually used it as the epigraph to two of my books, and, that, and I will now quote that. Um, he says, I, remember, I know this by heart, philosophy is world wisdom. Its problem is the world. And I like that because some people think philosophy is uh, you know, out there, up there, abstract, ivory tower but it's to do with reality in the world. So that's my definition. I like that. I, yeah, I love the, I love the seller's quote. Um, okay, so transitioning now to, uh, to talk about your work on consciousness, uh, which, which you're quite well known for at this point. How did you begin thinking about consciousness? How did you start thinking about the hard problem of consciousness and so forth? Um, well, I should think... Uh, I think everybody's bound to as soon as they start or very soon. I'm, I'm, I certainly I'd always been a materialist in the sense, in the philosophical sense, that I've always thought that there was nothing supernatural um, and that everything in the universe was wholly physical. Uh, and so, of course, uh, it, I had the, the standard problem, how could consciousness be physical? Uh, I was also pretty interested in psychoanalysis. I read a lot of Freud in my final year at university and, and in the theory of evolution. So I guess those things fed in, but I hardly need explanation why one gets interested in the, in the so-called problem of consciousness, because it, seem, it seems, although I think it's wrong, it seems like such a big problem. <laughs> how, okay, could, means... how could, no, if you're a materialist, if you're someone like me who thinks everything is physical, how could po consciousness possibly exist? Right, right. Okay, right. And okay. so I mean, that leads nicely into my next question. So do you oh. think that the, could the existence of consciousness be sensibly denied? 
<laughs> now you're laughing because you know I'm just setting you up. So um, yeah. no. <laughs> um, can I say is that it? Um, and why? And probably, why? Why not? Why? Why can't so you we probably need to ask me what do I mean by consciousness? I suppose. Right. Um, yeah. Why not? Well, what I mean by it is what I think you mean by it, and which is what most people who are talking about it today mean by it, which is the what it's like of, of everyday experience, color experience, taste experience, smell experience, pain experience, but also, and I would add this, I would mark this out also, the, the kind of overall experience you and I are having right now in talking to each other, that is, it's not just colors and sounds, right? There's, there's experience of understanding. So I just mean everything it's like for us to live, um, quality, you know, I, I don't know how to put it better than that. Um, in fact, I like the, I like as you, the, as Ned Block says, lifting a quotation from Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong, when he was asked what jazz was, said, "If you've got to ask, you ain't never going to know." Right. And I would say, if somebody comes along and asks me what consciousness is, I'm going to say the same thing. If you ask, you ain't never going to know. I think it's absurd. Okay. It's absurd to deny that. So given that, why did it become a common view among philosophers of mind and some scientists ah, in the 20th no, century just, that consciousness no, just, is an illusion, that it's not real? Um, um, wait, you're triggering my next um, <laughs> quotation here. I have to have, I have got this down on a piece of paper. Well, what can, I can give you a sociological explanation first. I'll give you very So which is, um, as Russell said, there are things that only philosophers with a long training in absurdity could succeed in believing. So I'll say that first. Um, and actually, there's um, there's a nice quotation I also like from Dan Daniel Kahneman. Um, and you know, this is based on, as it were, experimental work. He says, we know, I quote, we know that people can maintain an unshakable faith in any proposition, however absurd when they are sustained by a community of like-minded believers. So that's, as it were, the sociological explanation. But there is, of course, there's a, um, there is, a, as it were, a, an explanation of how people came seriously to think this. And I guess it goes like this. Um, first of all, they're materialists like me. They think that everything in the universe is wholly physical. Premise one, let's call that premise one. Premise two, oh, well, consciousness isn't physical, couldn't be physical. Just the very idea, idea of what it is. Um, and the conclusion follows immediately. It doesn't exist. Uh, now, that's what you have to do. But OK, here's the that's a bad argument. And what's wrong is the premise is the second premise is, is wrong as far as I'm concerned. The premise that says consciousness could not be physical. So my argument would go like this instead. Everything, materialism, everything in the world is wholly physical. Step premise one. Premise two, consciousness certainly exists. There is nothing more certain than that consciousness exists. Conclusion, consciousness is wholly physical. Next step, so the physical is, some, is not what we thought it was when we naturally thought that consciousness couldn't be physical. We've got to completely rethink what the physical is. So that's how I would go. And what is, what is it that, that drives this prior conviction of yours that physicalism must be true, right? So you said you've, yeah. always, you've always been a materialist. Why do you take that? It's just kind of- Well, like, I mean, the trouble- premise. Yeah, I mean, really, when I say that, I just mean that I'm a monist. I think there's only one kind of stuff. And I'm fully aware that when I say I'm a materialist or a physicalist, um, people are hearing that word in a way that I do not mean, because they, most people think that that means that you think that there can't be consciousness. So I'm really saying there's only one fundamental kind of stuff. I call it, why do I call it matter or the physical? Well, because it's certainly the kind of, it's certainly the thing that physics is about. Um, and you might not think that was a good enough reason, but so, I mean, it's, it's a good question because it makes me say that really, I just think there's only one fundamental kind of stuff. And I think a lot of physics is true. All that stuff is true, 
but I know that consciousness exists, so I have to accept that the stuff that physics is about, it also involves the existence of consciousness. And is it on the basis of parsimony type considerations that you prefer monism to dualism? Uh, no, no, um, no, not just that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think I'll, I'll put it like this. I think there's never been a single good argument for dualism. Mm. So I'm challenging you to say something. <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, I can say something. So, okay. I mean, here's, I'm maybe a little more sympathetic to, to dualism than you are. So, I mean, it, it kind of seems like a thought is a different sort of thing than my table here. You know, like I'm looking sure, at the table. Sure, 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 sure. The, the thought and the table seem like they're different kinds of things. So there's some sort of natural idea. Well, okay, there are these two different sorts of things in reality. But you Absolutely. don't like, why don't you like that sort of argument? Absolutely. But then I could say, well, you know, taste, taste is very different from vision. Ah, right. Um, it, in fact, the diff that's as radical a difference as I... Uh, so that would be, you know, the first reply. But uh, yeah, um, but or, then I would say something like, well, the fact that it seems very different to us human beings, why should that show that there's two fundamentally different kinds of stuff, especially since if you become a dualist, you immediately face the famous problem of interaction. Um, how, not only how could one kind of stuff have causal effects or well, actually the causal effects are meant to go both way. How could they affect each other? Um, I said not only, but I'm not sure what the, what the but also was. Um, so yeah, I've lost the but also, but um, that's, that's the, and, and I think it's widely agreed that there's never been any sort of remotely plausible account of that. Plus there's a lot of basically empirical evidence about, oh, of what we call the physical, the causal closure of the physical. That is, there is no evidence that, well, sorry, start again. If, if there was a, fun, if there was immaterial, non-material substance that was causally affecting material substance, you would have to see causal chains starting up in the, on the material or physical side that had no material or physical antecedents. And all the evidence is that we have never seen that. I mean, I'm not saying it's not impossible, but, um, so that's a that's a large empirical objection, uh, and, and my general position is this: that I would take causal interaction to be a sufficient condition of same substancehood. That is, I the mere fact that two things causally are at, interact, and the dualists definitely want that, mm -hmm. is enough for me to say it's best to think that the, the same kind of thing, the kind a kind of thing that can. That, that can that can have causal effects on itself in that way okay well so all of that leads nicely into uh the conversation that where, where i want to get where i want the conversation to go next which is about oh. panpsychism right oh. so so these considerations have led you to defend famously um a view called panpsychism i want to give you a chance because i think that you're often misrepresented panpsychism is often misrepresented what is panpsychism according to Galen Strawson? And do well, you endorse um, the position? <laughs> well, I mean, I, it's the same thing as it is according to the Oxford English Dictionary for a start. That is, it's a materialist view. Mm -hmm. It's a view that all matter has involves um, consciousness in some way. So I certainly object to anyone who says that there's, in fact, David Lewis, the, you know, the king, the, the hero of analytic philosophy, he himself says, I've got a quotation somewhere, but I don't think I can access it. He himself says that anyone who thinks that materialism rules out panpsychism has, doesn't understand what materialism is. So that's the first point. It's not, in, obviously, I've said already that I'm a materialist, so I'd better be able to say that I could be a materialist and a panpsychist. Um, because there are many uh, varieties of it. Um, but let me give you, I, I, perhaps it helps to give you what I see as the kind of the, the basic argument for panpsychism if you're already a materialist or a monist. So that it goes like this materialism is true, everything in the universe is wholly physical, consciousness certainly exists. So the first two premises are the same as before. Um, premise three, the no radical emergence. 
Um, nothing, wait, 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 let's see. Is that the best way to put it? Yes, so uh, I, I will put it like this. Consciousness could not possibly arise from something that was in its fundamental nature, wholly and utterly non-conscious. So, conclusion, or consciousness must in some way be already there at the bottom of things. And that's pretty much like the standard panpsychist view that consciousness is already intrinsically part of the nature of physical stuff from the start. Um, that's not to say, of course, there's anything like human consciousness. I think that all biological consciousness, all interesting consciousness, is evolved. You know, I'm a complete naturalist on that front. And how does panpsychism differ from other monist views that don't deny the existence of consciousness, like neutral monism or idealism? Well, uh, I don't know what neutral monism means anymore. I think it's it's just been a nightmare. The whole I don't thing. either. So I was hoping you could help. Uh, the whole discussion of it, it's just... Uh, when it began, it was really some, above all some kind of weird epistemological radical empiricist thesis, and it changed into something else. So um, until someone tells me, oh, I, I, I might put the burden on you, you'd have to tell me exactly what you think it means before I'm going to answer that. As for idealism, well, it, that's a ho another hopelessly messed up term. Um, do you mean... Barclay and idealism. Most people, when they use the word idealism, have Barclay in mind. And, that, and he says, as you know, that there's a fundamental sense in which all the tables and chairs are just ideas in people's minds. That's got nothing to do with the view I hold. I think that tables and chairs are really out there. And I think that there's you know, the physics description of them as made of um, you know, electrons, protons, and neutrons is cottoning on to something real and they law so but what i think about the stuff that they're made of is that it's which some people say is best thought of as simply energy i think of that kind of energy as already intrinsically consciousness involving so okay so yes one more thing i should say straight away of course i don't think i don't think that tables and chairs are I was doing, yeah, it's subjects right. Yeah, yeah right it just doesn't follow you can think as it were, let's just talk for simplicity about electrons. You can think that the electrons in the, that make up the chair are in the, the sort of fizzing energy that constitutes their being is somehow consciousness involving without thinking that when you put them together into the shape of a chair, you get a new, as it were, subject of experience, the chair, that, that is a conscious subject. I don't think that for a moment. Uh, they, so it, it no, no, no more follows from the fact that there's a sense in which the stuff it's made out of is conscious than it follows that a football team is a conscious subject because it's made up of conscious subjects, right? I mean, right. So, so, the, so the view is that whatever is whatever is fundamental, if we can talk in terms of particles, I don't know, particles, energy fields, whatever, experience is the essential nature of that stuff on your view but it's not the case that every composite of it made up of that essential stuff has its own special form of consciousness yeah 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 so i mean my i would think that of, of larger things that are conscious probably they're all biologically evolved right yeah okay. that's what that would be my bet right okay good and well, I guess maybe just to press that point a little bit further. So, I mean, why are you somewhat okay. conservative there? Uh, why why are you resistant to the idea that, yeah, like, you know, just <laughs> all composites have their own perspective or something? <laughs> um, well, because I, uh, I mean, for one thing, it seems grossly implausible. <laughs> And, but I mean, some people would say the whole view is grossly implausible. Yeah, that's but, right, right. So a lot of people well, say, well, no, I just like think it's plausible. So. Um, well, no, it's partly because I think that interesting consciousness, animal consciousness, biologically, uh, evolved for a purpose. And that wouldn't happen in the case of a chair. That's, that's one reason. And empirically, I, I think it highly plausible that you need some incredibly complicated 
electrochemical shenanigans to get you know interesting consciousness and chairs don't have it my brain has it and this the as it were the molecular structure of a chair just doesn't have the kind of electrochemical goings on of a sort that would be needed for interesting consciousness. But just to, to stave off any potential confusion there, right, your view is not that consciousness evolves. You don't think that consciousness can evolve. No, that's important. No, right. no, that's the whole thing that yeah. uh, consciousness, well, like the earlier argument, consciousness had to be there already for it right. ever to come into existence at all. But all the interesting consciousness that we encounter uh, in in the in the evolved in biologically evolved creatures did evolve. But it had, to, I mean, look, evolution. Put it like this: evolution needs something to work on. Right. So you could you could say, well, look, we've got these fantastic opposable thumbs that, that are meant to be, be what made us smart. Well, you know. Um, evolution had something to work on it had matter as body so too we now have these extraordinary sensory capacities and you know dogs and eagles have them even more refined than we do but again evolution needed something to work on it couldn't just make it out of nothing your thought is that if consciousness is there so that so that natural selection has that as a resource to work with yes. then yes. it might create agents because agents I, you know, are able to solve all sorts of problems and so forth. And those agents are going to have a perspective that allows them to solve problems, but you can't yeah. get consciousness yeah. from non-consciousness. So. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's as it were, the key. One of the key, and you find many people through, through history holding this same view. Um, but if you were to ask me to get, it's not as if I can give an argument for that. That is, um, as it were, a fundamental commitment. This, this idea that there's no radical emergence. If someone just comes along and says, well, why not? Uh, I don't know. I, there isn't an argument you can give against it. But what you can say is, well, we don't appeal to this notion of the radical emergence, such as would be the emergence of consciousness from the utterly non-conscious. We don't get, we don't appeal to that anywhere else in science. So methodological naturalism tells us that we ought not to appeal to it. And Really, you know, you can sort of, it's not so much you can shift the burden of argument, it's almost the burden of embarrassment, as it were. Why are you so desperately anxious to say that consciousness isn't, isn't down there in, in the fundamental nature of the physical? What, what's, is it just a great big prejudice or what? Um, because you create for yourself an enormous problem, if you say that, a problem which is solved, at least, in, at, least at a very general level, if you think that consciousness is already somehow part of the fundamental nature of physical stuff. Okay, okay, good. Yeah, and I mean, so an objection that people are sometimes going to give you there is they'll say, well, this is all, Gil, and this all just depends on an intuition, right? Like you, you have this intuition that you can't get consciousness from non-consciousness, but we can't really trust our intuitions. What do you say to that? Well, I mean, say, so where do they get the idea that matter is non-conscious? Mm -hmm. Also an intuition, right? So what evidence yeah. is there for it? There is zero evidence for it. I like so can you get rid of intuition in philosophy? Zero what? Can you get what? rid of intuition in philosophy? Yeah, you can just sort of you can just say your intuition I you have your your whole thing is based on an intuition too. But actually right. now now you've just triggered me and I'm going to give you some quotations from some Nobel Prize winners for physics. Okay. So first of all, Lawrence, you know, you know what famous guy, he says, I quote, the mental and the material are two sides of the same thing. Schrodinger, the material universe and consciousness are made out of the same stuff. De Bruy, he's the guy, it's spelled De Broglie, you know, but he's pronounced De Bruy. Another Nobel Prize winner says, I regard consciousness and matter as different aspects of one thing. Max Planck, Consciousness is fundamental and matter derivative from consciousness. Okay. Um, and so on. So it's not, you know, it's weirdly, it's it's the philosophers who've gone truly crazy, in my view, in denying the existence of consciousness. Um, but physicists are, are not with them on that. I mean, some of them probably are, but they're much more sensible. And so, I mean, so since you're since you're citing uh, all these people from the past, I mean, uh, is 
is panpsychism, as you understand it, a new view? Did you just come up with this in the 1990s or something, or has it been around for a long time? Of course not. I mean, I'm not good on the history, but there's a book by um, David Scribina called Panpsychism in the West, which basically is just a, an amazing compilation of quotations for, for two and a half thousand years of um, showing how, how persistent the idea of panpsychism is. Um, I mean, Russell is on the verge of it, though he's never going to um, admit it. Um, he's never going to say it outright, but okay. Sorry, but um, listen to Russell. Okay, you ready? All right, it's much better if people like Russell talk than if I do. First quotation from his famous 1912 book, The Problems of Philosophy. Common sense leaves us completely in the dark as to the true intrinsic nature of physical objects. And if there were good reason to regard them as mental, we could not legitimately reject this opinion merely because it strikes us as strange. The truth about physical objects must be strange. Okay. More Russell, 15 years later, 1927, we know nothing of the intrinsic quality of the physical world. And therefore we do not know whether it is or is not very different from that percepts, percepts are mental occurrences. And here's another one I particularly like, still 1927. If there is any intellectual difficulty in supposing that the physical world is intrinsically quite unlike that of percepts, this is a reason for supposing that there is not this complete unlikeness. And of course, there is a huge intellectual difficulty in supposing that the physical world is quite unlike that of mental goings on. It's called the hard problem, the problem of consciousness, the one that everybody thinks is the great problem. So, and all that is absolutely dead on. We don't know the intrinsic nature of matter why should we then suppose something that creates an enormous difficulty for us? The idea that it's in no way already consciousness in its basic nature. So as it were, I would say that common sense, that is, you know, thoughtful common sense supports panpsychism because it, okay, it's not saying there aren't problems with the theory. I, I'm sure you're going to mention one later, but to say that the initial case, it's the natural view. Inflammatory, inflammatory as always. Okay, yes, you know, I'm just, I'm just thinking of, I'm thinking of our illusionist friends and so forth, saying that well, I, that panpsychism is the natural view. But yes, I mean, I'm, I'm with you there. So. Well, I mean, are you? Is this another trigger? Because, <laughs> you know, the illusionists, you know, the guys who deny the existence of consciousness, uh, you know, you know, Dan Dennett. Uh, a man called Francois Camera, a man called who else is there? There's Keith Frankish. Frankish. Yes. Yes. yes, and now Jay Garfield is doing it as a Buddhist. Um, well, I just think that here's how I would reply to them. So, if you're right, I would say to them, there's no suffering, right? Because there's no conscious experience, okay. so there's no suffering. So that that's your view. Well. That's great. I wish, you know, I wish there were no suffering, but I suggest to them that they go and see, maybe go and see someone who's being crucified and say, don't worry, mate, there's no suffering. So there's nothing wrong with being crucified. Or maybe a woman who's, you know, suffering extraordinarily in childbirth and, you know, who may, who may die in the end. Or, or, let, or go to Ukraine and tell all the people there who've lost their fathers or mothers or children that there's it's an illusion there's no suffering i just think i think it's actually a disgusting view and um yeah, I mean, it's it's hard hard to, out, what it's hard to see how we could how we could have ethics how how there would be no, well, no, ethics is gone the no there is no theory. no harm has ever been done to anyone ever yeah. and i mean it's funny it's comic in a way because it would mean that there wasn't a problem of evil because right. nobody ever suffered they get a little bonus on that one but i think it's just it shows contempt utter contempt for the reality of human life and human suffering and it's shocking to me that people can go can as it were follow a theoretical idea to that point yeah and it seems like <laughs> Even if you don't, even if you don't hold the view of ethics on which ethics is fundamentally about reducing suffering and 
promoting happiness or something. Yeah. Still, it seems like everybody has to say that you have to have conscious subjects in order for there to be ethical cool. duties, in order for there to be facts about right, right. wrong, good, yeah. bad, and so yeah. forth. Um, yeah. Yes, that's right. Even independently of um, whether, whether, whether it's really independent. Yeah, conscious subjects. So, yeah, you've got to have consciousness. So I'm thinking about Kant, for example. I mean, so Kant's going to say morality is not about it's not about reducing suffering, um, but it seems like to be a Kantian, you still have to think that there are conscious agents or it's yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's, that's who, who is owed respect if there aren't conscious agents. Yeah, um, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Or people who, or things that can do the right thing. Uh, I mean, you could, you, I suppose you could build a, a robot that was a very good Kantian, mm -hmm. but um, I suppose it they would. Have will. It wouldn't have what? a good will, it seems, right? I, well, no, but it would always it would always sort of apply the categorical imperative and work out what the Kantian thing to do was, or or it would say, "I cannot lie," you know. <laughs> does panpsychism have have any since you went there? I mean, does it have anything to say uh, about the potential for AI to be conscious? Since people talk about these things these days, um, no, I've I, up up until recently, I've been rather. I mean, I really don't. I don't think for a moment that any current or foreseeable future machines are conscious. And um, I mean, I obviously would resist the idea that some people think that you can say that something is conscious as soon as it behaves in a sufficiently complex way. Um, but I, I certainly certainly wouldn't rule it out um, a priori, or I just don't know. I mean, one question would be whether, whether the kind of electromechanical complexity you find in a in a computer or so could somehow be sufficiently of the same kind as the electrochemical complexity you find in our brains as to be is for there to be um larger scale consciousness uh, mm -hmm. okay. yeah no it certainly can't be ruled out a priori okay okay so it's not the case that the panpsychist must take a particular position in that in that debate, um, no. as you see it. No. Okay, no. okay. Good. There can't All be right. any reason, in principle, why you couldn't build something that was conscious. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So we've got it. We've got to touch on the one the one perennial objection to panpsychism, right? So I'll try to I'll try to state it, and then um, we'll yeah. see what you say in response. Um, okay. So I take it that the the main objection people raise to the view. Um, once they kind of get over the, you know, the emotional response or whatever, that it's weird, is that um, it's not clear how you get a single unified subject of experience, if that subject of experience is composed of countless little conscious bits, right? So to flesh that out a little bit further, on the panpsych issue, we're going to say, you know, so my brain, um, which is where consciousness is located for me, right? I panpsychists agree with that. My brain's going to be made up of what, like a hundred billion neurons or something, and each of those neurons is composed of little conscious bits. And all those little conscious bits, on your view, have a what it's likeness. They have some kind of experience, very basic experience. But then they all somehow together produce me, and I experience myself as a single subject of experience. Right? Like I am in pain. I, you know, I'm excited about something and so forth. So. Yeah, how could that possibly be the case that there's just one of me if I'm made up of all these little bits? So what do you what yeah. do you say to that? Um, and did I do well, that yeah. justice? Yeah, I mean the, the objection was put famously by William James in mm -hmm. in his 1890 book, The Principles of Psychology, and yet even in that book he basically thinks that panpsychism must be right. But yeah, the idea is you can't sum subjects, individual little blips of blobs of consciousness can't, as it were, fuse into a single large conscious subject of the sort that you are. Uh, uh, there's a, a lovely passage again in William James's late book, um, A Pluralistic Universe, where he says, you know, I've, I've thought, struggled with this. I've covered hundreds of sheets of paper with notes. And, um, and he, just, he, he just said, I think it must happen. But I don't know how. But he actually refers there before. I think there was a, there was a general field theory. He, he 
brings in the notion of field. So the first, I think the first thing I would say is that the, the picture of all the little bits isn't really right. Um, you do have to, well, you do have to operate with a field theoretic conception of the nature of the physical, um, as in, for example, well, relativistic quantum field theory. So and, and I, I know where this might lead you next, but right. so that particular problem, I think, goes away. Mm. Somehow you get, um, as it were, small fields within the overall, I am talking completely impressionistically, and that they somehow constitute um, the kinds of conscious states that you and I experience. So you, what you do there is you abandon the, the smallest position, the bit where lots, lots of little bits position of the nature of the physical world. And I mean, that I would say has just gone in, in physics. So all, that's all to the good. It's not yet a positive account of how it might work, but it is and removes the objection, the standard combination problem objection. Okay, but then I wasn't going to go here, but it seems that now I have to. I mean, now <laughs> like maybe there's a worry from the other direction, right? How do we get individuated subjects of consciousness on this field picture where it seems like the natural view might be, well, there's just like this single mind. The universe is one big mind, but you and I, you know, experience ourselves as individuated subjects within that yeah. broader field. So how does that work? Yeah, um, well, again, um, not saying any of it is easy, um, but what we, whatever we, however much it's true that there's in some sense one just one single thing, the universe. And I think, I think that it, you know, this is called what I call thing monism. It's not sub, it's not stuff monism or substance monism that says there's only one fundamental kind of stuff. It's thing monism that says there's only ultimately only one thing, and I think that's probably the right thing to say about the universe but of quite obviously if um there are a lot there seem there's in some sense in which there are lots of things you and me and and the tables and chairs again so um i would how can i it, how can i put this um i think i would partly appeal to evolution so we've got the so things have evolved that move around and and have to survive in an, in an environment. And consciousness has been, interesting consciousness has been wholly driven by that. So I would just, I would quote something called Orgel's second rule. I don't know if you know what that is. What it says is evolution is cleverer than you are. So it's just, uh, th there shouldn't be any more problem about how there can be these seemingly isolated consciousnesses like yours and mine than there is about how there can be seemingly isolated things like tables and chairs and human beings. So something along those lines. I'm, I'm, let me say again that it, you know, it's not as if um, I know what exactly what to say. And in fact, I don't hold out any hope for, as it were, some interesting science flowing from this position. I don't think there's much can be done. I just think that there are extremely powerful general metaphysical philosophical reasons for thinking that panpsychism is as economists say the least worst metaphysical view <laughs> right also winston <laughs> churchill said something similar about democracy right so it's the, the yeah least worst they didn't of all use democracy. least worst which is kind of appalling really it's like I they see. also say first best on i see okay is, okay all right very good so i think that's it I think we kind of covered all of the covered all of the bases there, as yeah. it were. Um, in, in the philosophy of mind. In the philosophy of mind, do you have any any other things we didn't get to on panpsychism or anything? All right. No, I um, I just think it's very important to stress a point that as it really was a commonplace a hundred years ago that we know nothing that physics tells us nothing about the intrinsic nature of the physical. Um, so which just got lost in analytic philosophy after about 1960. So from then on, everybody seems to think they can know for sure that the physical is in no way consciousness in its basic nature. And so we went backwards. We went seriously backwards. And we haven't yet fully recovered so, in analytic philosophy, I would say.
Yeah. Yeah. And do you, I mean, do you think things are, how do you see the future? Do you think things are getting better uh, in this front or, or what? I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we live in a world with sort of daily proofs of, sort of monstrous irrationality and people being able to believe anything as long as other people in their gang believe it in the way that Kahneman describes. And I mean, I find that profoundly sad and depressing, but so uh, who knows? I mean, it, I hope that we'll make some progress in, in, in getting back to the, the commonplace of a hundred years ago, that as it were, nothing in science or physics gives us any reason to repeat, gives us any reason to think that consciousness isn't one of the fundamental properties. It, it seems to me as somebody who granted wasn't around at the time that maybe the conversation has opened up a, a little bit in the last 10, 20 yeah. years or something on this front. Uh, yes, I think so. I think yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Because I feel like, you know, like panpsychism is, it's not part of the conversation again, at least. Oh, it's definitely, oh, very much yeah. so. Right. Yeah. And funnily enough, I suppose about 15 years ago when I had one of my students, Philip Goff, was applying for jobs and he would write to me saying you know should I say on my application that I'm you know I'm sympathetic to panpsychism he thought I mean the view was you better not say that because you will not be taken seriously and I think <laughs> I think we moved on from there yeah um, that's, that doesn't seem to be the case anymore um yeah yeah and he's and he's subsequently written a written a popular book about these things so um, right. right I might link to that okay um you want to transition to talk about a couple of other things before I, I let you go here? Um, sure. All right. Um, free will. So you, I, you've you written on free will. You've, so you've got a, um, a well-known book, Freedom and Belief, a paper, The Impossibility of Moral Responsibility. And as you know, those had a profound impact on me. I went through a, a free will crisis and Galen, <laughs> Galen was helpful in uh, getting me out of that crisis, I guess, when I was younger. But um, yeah, can you, I mean, so what is your position on free will, just in the broadest terms, how would you describe yourself? Oh, dear. Um, yeah, I'm kind of burnt out on free will, but I mean, I, I do hold that there is a, a very core sense in which we cannot be ultimately morally responsible for what we do. Um, that's, the, um, do you want the argument? <laughs> Go, go for it. If you don't do it, then I'll do it. So, yeah, you go for See it. If I can get it right without something. So, premise one, we do what we do because of the way we are. Uh, right? yeah. Yeah. Premise two, um, so in order to be truly ultimately responsible for what we do, we'd have somehow to be ultimately responsible for the way we are. Three, but we can't be ultimately responsible for the way we are so for we can't be ultimately responsible for what we do and of course it's number three that, that people will query first why can't we be ultimately responsible for the way we are but then I mean, there are various ways of expounding that i mean one is first of all we're born with the genetic inheritance we have and then there's the early upbringing we have and whatever we do later as presumably rational adult beings, we do because we were shaped in the way that we were shaped by our genetic inheritance and our early experience. So there's a, because as it were, an a posteriori argument there, but there's also, as you know, there's the a priori argument, which goes like, well, the, you, it raises a question, says, well, what would we have to do to be ultimately responsible for how we are? Well, clearly, we'd somehow have to have brought it about that we are the way we are. Um, well, suppose we did that. Well, in that case, we would already have to have been there already with a certain character and certain preferences about how to be in the light of which we chose how to be. But then what about the way we already were? Before? And so on, where you get, you get what's called an infinite regress argument that you cannot get back behind yourself in some radical way, in such a way as to be able to make yourself um, without already having preferences about how to be. And, and just to, to put a fine point on this, to make it, you know, uh, so Galen's argument here doesn't depend upon considerations adduced from genetics, from behavioral no. psychology no. or anything like that, right? You're not, no, you're no. not arguing that, um, yeah, that we're, we're 
because we're causally determined or something to act in a certain way by our genes or whatever, uh, that that's why we're not ultimately responsible. We could be immaterial souls on your view and still lack ultimate responsibility because we wouldn't have had any say over the fundamental nature of our soul. Um, yeah, it's metaphysically impossible right. to right. be ultimately responsible because you'd have to be in the Latin phrase causa sui, that is the cause of yourself. And I mean, I would agree with Spinoza who says not even God could do that because he'd have to be there already with a certain nature in order to determine what nature he, or as Philip Goff would say, she <laughs> would have. Um, it's a logical impossibility. So right. it's a different ball game, nothing to do with empirical facts, as you say about genetics or. Right, that's a, that's a, the genetics thing, like that's a totally separate line. Of yeah, and oh yes, and also it makes no difference whether yeah. determinism is true or false. Right, right. Yeah, um, we should make that clear, right? So this isn't- So you could use, determinism. If, you have, if determinism right. is true, well then everything, yeah. you know, as they say, everything, the way, everything that you've done was fixed at the Big Bang, as it were. Yeah. But if indeterminism is true, if there's truly random stuff going on, that doesn't help either, because yeah. that doesn't give you any way to somehow create yourself to be ultimately responsible for the way you are. Um, and so you think I don't like this argument, by the way, particularly, I mean, I don't like the conclusion. And I mean, you're probably, I don't want to sort of anticipate what you're going to say. I mean, I, it's not as if I think that it's, I suppose I still naturally live in some sense in the belief in mm. free will, but. Uh -huh. Right. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I want to try to see exactly what the connection is here between what we're calling free will and this notion of ultimate responsibility. So is your view that the impossibility of ultimate responsibility, our inability to create ourselves, does that mean that we don't have free will or is there a notion of free will that could survive the impossibility of what you think is impossible? Yeah, sure, S certainly there is. Um, and I would say, I mean, actually I would agree with someone who I often disagree very deeply with, that is Dan Dennett. That is, um, I mean, the, his interesting book in, I think, 1984 was called Elbow Room. And the subtitle was The Varieties of Free Will Worth Wanting. And he makes the point really that Hume also makes is that um, really what matters is to be able to do what you want to do or think, think right or think best to do. And, um, given how you are, and we can have that freedom, uh, but it also can be taken away from us because we can be locked up or, um, and so on. So uh, free will can only, as it were, insofar as it's something that we can have, um, can only be something like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's occurred to me, though, that it, this is not a position that I really see anybody defend, but it seems to me that in principle, somebody could accept what you say about the impossibility of ultimate responsibility and then still think that we have libertarian freedom of a kind. You don't, I don't think you even would have to be a compatibilist. You could be a Chisomian style agent causal libertarian, but just deny that the libertarian freedom that you had rendered you ultimately responsible for your acts. Does that seem? Well, right? I guess, I guess so, but I would, you know, I then want to know exactly what this person thinks the radical freedom consists in yeah. um, it can because i think that i think it, it could be the, it could be the freedom to act just because you as an agent have decided to act and i think you could grant that but then just say mm -hmm. that well you still wouldn't be ultimately responsible for what you did because you weren't sure. responsible for the nature that drove you sure. to take that act right? sure and, and presumably if this was meant to be something worth having you would want your ex to somehow be expressive of or to be in the service of um, what you valued. Um, right. So so again, it would be flowing from how you are, and that in turn would be something for which you weren't ultimately responsible. So I don't know. Is it a bit like Sartre and existential freedom or something? I don't think they want that, do they? No. 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 The sort no, of think, ability yeah. to make a kind of seemingly random, perfectly unmotivated choice. Nobody that's not meant to be. Yeah, well, and then of course they don't think it's random, but it, how exactly it's not random, no one's ever been able to explain to me. So yeah, I don't know. <laughs> right. In any case.
Okay. Um, okay. Maybe just I can't help myself. It one one last question on the free will. <laughs> so um, you say we can't deny the existence. You it's just you know like the fact that consciousness is real is immediately apparent. You know it, it's, it would be the silliest possible view um, to deny the existence of consciousness. Yeah. Sometimes people will say, "Well, look, I just in the same way I experience myself as radically free." So why couldn't I make the same sort of experiential argument for my radical freedom that you make for the reality of consciousness? Well, I think, I mean, I think the best answer I can think of is that they're different things. So the, the claim that you can know the nature of experience is because you're immediately acquainted with it, but you're not immediately acquainted with actual free will you're immediately acquainted with the experience of having it the free the feeling of it and the feeling of it isn't the thing itself i mean the the impossibility of ultimate moral responsibility isn't isn't um as it were an experiential thing it's, yeah. uh so it'd be something like that but yeah so i think like what, what your view is is that we can on reflection we can immediately see the impossibility of ultimate responsibility but on reflection you can't but see that consciousness is real. Yeah. Right? No, but you see, the thing is that you, as you as you know, I agree with you that there's a sense in which we can't help experiencing ourselves as free. And I have my little toy story about that. About I'm I actually it? skeptical of that. I think you're more what? sold on that than I am. Yeah. Sorry, what? I'm more. I'm actually somewhat skeptical of that. I think you're more sold on that. I, I think that it's not mm. totally clear that we have to think of ourselves as free. And I'm not totally sure what that means if you think that okay, it well, involves okay. well, an impossibility. Right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give the little story anyway. So, yeah. so the yeah. story is that it's the evening of a national holiday and you've got some food ready for a party, but you think that you'd like to have another cake to make everything nice. So you go to the shop, you've got $10, and there's one cake left in the shop which is about to close and it costs $10. And so you think, great, you're going to go in and buy the cake. But on the doorstep of the shop, there is... A, a very, very, there's, no, there's someone collecting for a charity. And, you know, there's a great deal of poverty and famine in the world. And you could, you've already got stuff at home. You could put your $10 into, into the Oxfam box. Uh, so you have a choice. You go in and buy the cake or you put the money in the Oxfam box. And my claim is that even if you believe the argument that shows an ultimate moral responsibility is impossible, you cannot help living that moment as a moment of radical freedom. Um, you, that you can either put the money in the box or go in and buy the cake. You may even think that determinism is true. So you may think that in two minutes time, you can turn around and look back and say, oh, well, what I did was determined. But in the, as it were, in the lived moment, right. you must experience yourself as free. That's the idea. And of course, there, are, there, are, there might be some people who would actually go on from that and say that is freedom. Uh -huh. It is, it's the, this linking back to your earlier question, is, is, is that a kind of freedom that lived, in not only lived, but inevitable experience of radical choice? But you say you're not, you don't get that. Well, but then, I mean, so what I'm interested in is this purported symmetry between your argument for the undeniability of consciousness and the argument that other people make for the, undemi for the undeniability of free will. But I think what you're going to say is that you can step back and in a moment of reflection, see that the radical freedom involving self-creation that you maybe perceive yourself yeah. as having is illusional, uh, is an illusion, but you That's can't right. see the same thing about conscious experience because consciousness... No, there, is no, there is no step back. Right. So you have exactly. the feeling of radical freedom. That's a feeling that something that isn't an experience exists. Yes. That is, whereas in the experiential case, that's already the dead end. It's not. That is the term. That's the thing itself, right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so, um, yeah, something yeah. like that. Okay. Okay. Very good. So, there's no. I guess the big picture there is I'm seeing that, um, despite what some people may say, you're not committed to some sort of inconsistency by being a skeptic about free will, no. but being a realist about consciousness. It's yeah. funny you should say that because Georges Ray has always said to me, "Look, you are kind of radical about free will." Yeah. Why aren't you equally radical about consciousness? Because he, yeah. he's often defended the, the denial position. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah. Not, I say not the same. Yeah. 
Right, indeed. Importantly dissimilar, yes. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm mindful of your time, but I think maybe we can touch on a couple more things before, mm -hmm. before we adjourn. Okay, the self, the self. So mm -hmm. um, very briefly here. So, um, so you say that you said that you don't feel a strong sense of connection to your past and future selves. Mm -hmm. Can you describe mm -hmm. that a little bit? I mean, so <laughs> what is it like to be Galen? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, uh, I'd like to know what it's like to be someone else who does. Uh, I, I, I know that you and I differ very deeply yeah. on this in, in as much as I basically have no memory, very rotten memory of personal memory. And whereas you say you can remember things in almost, as it were, not well, as it were in real time, in the sense that a thing that happened for five minutes in the past, would, you can remember in taking five minutes to remember it. I think that's what you've said. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't agree. really know. I mean, yeah. well, so if I think about the boy I was, I just, you know, it could be anyone. You could, mm -hmm. I have no sense that that's me. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's not much more I can say than that kind of thing. Or when I think of, um, I think that me is just here now. And um, even yesterday seems, you know. <laughs> uh, and this and this also holds true to the future. You don't, you don't feel like yeah. you... Yeah, I mean, one of the oddities here is that I can, you know, as I've said, written somewhere, I can, when I think about the future, I have in the, you know, I can feel fear at the idea that I'm going to die. But um, so in that sense, I must be thinking of myself as though in the future. But uh, if I think about tomorrow or next month or something, I, it has no force. Um, mm. But that's not, that's not to say that I'm, I'm, I'm not, and I can sort of plan perfectly efficiently and so on. Um, um, yeah, yeah, you can not... complete big books, for example, you know. Um, uh, yeah, but then that, that's interesting you should say that because they're not, they sort of happen by, they sort of grow from the inside and they grow by insertion. Um, so, okay. yeah, no, but that's right. You, you don't have to have a sense of yourself as persisting through time in order to, to do something like that because you sit down at the table and then you read the last sentence and you that's it you're you're locked in by that yeah well you and i together prove this because i i have a strong sense of myself over time and, and i'm not nearly as productive as you are so <laughs> no that's not going to work because there'll be definitely be object definitely be people who who are different in that way um do you think that your view is closer to the metaphysical truth or sorry, sorry. Do you think your experience is closer to the met so, like the way you live? Do you think that's actually tracking the way things are metaphysically? Um, well, I not really. So, if you were to ask me, what do I think is the best account of the self? If if we got to have to use that word to name something, what should we use it to name? Then I would, I would be inclined to say that as it were there's a new self with every experience and that would lead to another point because i don't actually people think that experience within a given day is a kind of continuing stream and i'm not even sure that that's true i guess that's ultimately an um an empirical question but i think that it's kind of gappy it might even be linked you know to the 40 hertz oscillation in the brains and we have a lot of stitching software that makes it seem that it's smooth and continuous but on the other hand of course there are enormous um, cons um consistencies in the in the character of any human being and in what they know and so on and this is all nicely based in the brain and that there is there is a real long-term community continuity there but I think of the self as something that's essentially alive or active in, in the moment of experience. So I don't think of all the, as it were, the stuff that's stored in the brain as the self. This is, I can see this isn't, I'm not doing very well here, but you could think of the self as a kind of complex brain structure that, that persists really throughout your life and that grows and evolves. And that would by our normal standards of continuing things, be a genuinely continuing thing. Um, and I'm not saying that picture of the self is wrong. I'm just saying that um, insofar as I think of the self as the, the thing that is live in the moment, um, then I think that it's short-lived and there are many of them.
Okay, that, so that may, that may answer this next question a bit. So do you think that people who do a lot of self-narration who, and who do see these connections between past, present, and future, do you think that they ought to try to engage with the world differently? Should they try to correct for that? Is that like a problem, do you think? Should they try to be more like you are? Or, or should you well, try to be more like they are? <laughs> I've, uh, yeah, I've thought about this quite a lot, and I've been fairly cautious. I don't think... I'm sort of tempted polemically to say that, well, I do think there's a great deal wrong with having a very sort of narrative view of your life, but uh, I can lead to all sorts of problems, but I wouldn't, overall, I don't think that there's a kind of positive correlation between leading a better life and being what I call episodic. Um, some, most people would think it was the other way around. They would think it was Right, I was going to say that. So, I mean, it's a common view that in order to lead a meaningful life, right, you, you have to do a lot of self-narrating and so forth. So you, you certainly don't accept that view, I guess, right? No, um, no. Yeah. And I just think that it's, you know, it's just a place of illusion, as Aris Murdoch would say. That, um, it's best, best not, it rarely helps to think too hard about yourself and your life and what you it sounds it sounds pretty strange but um interesting right okay well okay but it depends on you know there are there are fundamental different types of people and there is a best life for someone who's naturally very narrative and the best life for someone who's kind of more in the right moment. you tend to be very pluralistic and ecumenical about this i think right yeah, yes. yeah. I, I would be um i said but i would object to people there are a lot of people who say you you cannot they, they can right. you cannot live a good life unless you have this narrative outlook and I think that's just wrong. So. Okay. 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 Well, that I mean that leads nicely into I I guess one of my last two questions for you. What do you think makes a life go well? What does it mean to oh. lead a beautiful life? I. <laughs> uh, well, I really don't like using the word meaning in connection, either the meaning of life or meaning in life i can't remember whether i sent you a recent paper right you did uh, yes yeah i totally right. get it yeah um what is i mean i think meaningfulness is meant to be something good but you know then i'm going to say well what about hitler you know hitler's okay. life that was full of meaning it was it was driven by an intense purpose it was full of the most extraordinarily events and i mean the events were extremely interesting and in that sense meaningful although of course what was most of what was interesting about them was how awful they were so i need someone to tell me what meaningful means uh, it seems it like it mean, for that sort of reason it seems like it must connect to the moral truth in some way right like yeah. so all uh, right but then i wonder is is leading a meaningful life different from just leading a morally good life um and i'm not sure about that at all uh well i would say you know a bit like butler i think that it's kind of um self-interest and morality coincide so um i really think how should you live your life i think the answer is to be is to strive to be kind and good and and for no other reason that you will live the happiest and best life that you're capable of I don't think that having a driving purpose is necessarily part of a meaningful life. Um, I think you can be a farmer, as it were, sowing and reaping your fields and doing all your daily tasks, um, just in order to survive, as it were, to, and lead as the best life that a human can live. So I don't think you have to be a great artist or anything like that. Um, be I kind think, and good. I okay, like that. I'll try something else. Like I, what? I, think, I love the simplicity of just be kind and good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, um, I think, what do I think is the greatest achievement of life? I think it's to live in harmony with another human being mm -hmm. over a, a reasonably long term and the most rewarding thing to do too. So um, I think these are, just drop the word meaning. Let's just drop the word meaning. That's, um, yeah. A good, life. Uh, a good life so i mean look you good life so of course aristotle says there are four cardinal virtues you should be just um sensible <laughs> temperate and courageous and i mean courageous not in the sense of going to war but just 
facing up to life. And those those are pretty good. That's a pretty good start. But actually, I don't think they're necessary for a good life because I think you could be very weak and sort of very erratic. Yeah. But you might still be a kind and good person. So right. Right. I have a different priority. This is not because I've been infected by some dodgy Christian point of view. It's just <laughs> it's an empirical guess about what how people who live best do so. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I really like that answer. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. In conclusion. Um, future projects what are you working on what what do we have to look forward to from you mm, well i'm kind of no i mean there's just lots of things that i would like to get finished and then i would like i don't i'd like to as it were do something else or to some extent so i mean so that's there are no grand new future projects i i thought i was once going to write a whole book about this narrativity issue and but, but i've just I have, it's not going to happen. I mean, I've written some articles, and, as it were, the basic content of what I think is there. But I do want to finish a thing about Descartes, because I think everybody's absolutely wrong about what Descartes thinks the mind is. Ah. And so to add to my little, as you know, I now think, well, almost everyone's wrong about what Hume thinks about causation. Almost everyone's wrong about what he thinks about personal identity. Almost everyone's wrong about what Locke thinks about personal Locke identity. Thinks, right? yeah. So I now want to add this. I think that, um, yeah, I want to finish that. And I suppose have one more go at a summary view about putting the case for panpsychism, but kind of daunt, I'm feeling a bit daunted by that. Um, <laughs> well, a lot of people would love to read it. I would love to read it. So I hope that that comes to fruition. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, well, um, so maybe you can stay on for just a second. We can stay our farewells after I stop the recording. But um, for now, I mean, yeah, actually, there is one thing I do actually want to write. Yeah. Try to write something about sex and love, but because ah. I think everyone, everyone's wrong. I mean, that yeah. would probably sell, you know. Uh, uh, well, well, yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, here's I'll give you a, a one thing I want to say. I think that a lot of people cite Proust when they talk about. I think Proust knows absolutely nothing about what love is. And I actually think he knows that. <laughs> so don't go to Proust. If... <clears throat> Very intriguing. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that we'll, we'll look forward to that one too. Um, all right. I'll, I'll stop to record. Thank you so much for your time, Galen. Yeah. Um, it's well, been great. It's lovely I'll to stop see recording. you. Talk. Let's see, stop recording recording and we are off. Okay, I am here with Galen Strassen, who was my dissertation supervisor. More interestingly, he is the author of lots of really interesting articles and books on topics ranging from free will to the nature of the self to uh, the hard problem of consciousness. He's currently professor of philosophy at the University of Texas at Austin uh, and was previously at Oxford for many years, has had lots of other positions. I will, I, Gail and I will link to more information about you in the description of the video. Uh, is there anything that you want to say about yourself that I left out just now? Um, of that kind, no. Okay, okay, not of that kind. Okay, let's dive in and I will, yeah, I'll post a whole bunch of interesting books and articles that Gail and his written uh, in the in the description of this video. Okay, so what I want to talk to you about today, Galen, is uh, your work on some of these big topics that I just mentioned. So um, 